Katherine Dunham was an extraordinary woman who changed the face of American modern dance. Her creative influence was significant to the pioneering work she did in the field of dance anthropology and the school she founded that embodied multicultural principles decades before the term was used in the field of education. She was a world famous dancer, choreographer, author, anthropologist, social activist, and humanitarian. Katherine Dunham was born June 22, 1909 in Glen Ellen, Illinois. Her mother, Fanny June Dunham, was white French Canadian and of American Indian heritage. Her father was black American. Her mother was an assistant principal at a school in Chicago. Her father, Albert Millick Dunham, was a tailor, an apprentice to German tailors. Her father was very successful in his business. According to Catherine, despite her parents' interracial marriage, which was rare at the time, the family had a happy existence in their small town. At the age of three, Catherine's mother died. Her death was a devastating shock to her father. She was in her 30s when they married. Her father, a young man of only 21, gave up his dream of opening a dry cleaners in Glen Ellen and became a traveling tailor. He left Catherine and her older brother Albert with relatives until he came back with his new bride, Annette Dunham. She was the only mother Catherine ever knew. Later, the family moved to Juliet, Illinois, where she spent her adolescent years. She began dancing at an early age and had a passion for writing. Catherine was known as a brainy and scholarly young lady. At the age of 12, she wrote a short story, Come Back to Arizona, which appeared in volume two, August 1921, of the Brownies book, a periodical edited by W.E.B. Du Bois. She moved to Chicago in 1928 to study ballet with Ludmilla Speranziva and eventually enrolled at the University of Chicago. Speranziva was one of the first ballet teachers to accept black dancers as students. She introduced Catherine to Spanish dancers La Argentina, Quill Monroe, and Vicente Escudero. Catherine also studied ballet with Mark Turberfull and Ruth Page, and through Vera Morova, she was exposed to East Indian, Javanese, and Balinese dance forms. While at the University of Chicago, she attended a lecture by Robert Redfield, a professor of anthropology who specialized in American Indian and African cultures. From him, she learned that much of black culture in modern America had begun in Africa. She decided to major in anthropology and to focus on dances of the African diaspora. In the course of her studies, she attended classes taught by Redfield, A.R. Radcliffe Brown, Edward Sapir, Lloyd Warner, and others. In 1930, she formed a dance company, Ballet Nick, one of the first Negro ballet companies in America. Ballet Nick had its debut performance at the annual Bow Arts Ball in Chicago. One of the numbers on the program, Negro Rhapsody, was well received. However, no engagements followed. The group eventually disbanded. In 1931, she married Jordis McCoo, a postal worker. Although he danced in some of her productions, he did not share her interests. They gradually drifted apart. Catherine was determined not to give up on her dream. With the help and advice from her teacher and mentor, Ludmilla Speranziva, she decided to open a school for young black dancers where she could teach them about their African heritage. She shifted her focus away from ballet to focus on modern dance, developing her own style. One evening during a public performance she gave in an abandoned Chicago loft, she was spotted by the daughters of philanthropist Julius Rosenwald, who promptly suggested she apply for a Rosenwald Foundation grant. For almost two years, she studied the dances and cultures of the West Indies. She used her fellowship to travel, study, and take notes on primitive dance and customs from various island people. In Jamaica, she lived with the Maroon peoples of the high country, who taught her Karamanti dances remembered from Africa. In Marantique, she saw for the first time the wrestling dance called La Aja from which she later drew inspiration for a number in her famous Balneg Review. In Haiti, she felt a strong sense of identification with the place and people. She became fascinated with the dance religion called Vodun. She returned to the U.S. armed with enough material for a master's thesis, as well as for a full-length book on the Maroons. Her account of her experiences, Journey to Akinpong, 
published in 1946, reveals a perceptive young woman with a lush romantic sensibility. In August of 1936, she received a PhD degree, Bachelor of Philosophy degree, from the University of Chicago. Her major was recorded as Social Anthropology. In 1938, Catherine began her film career with Carnival of Rhythm, a short film written by Stanley Martin, directed by Jean Niglesco, and produced by Warner Brothers. It's devoted entirely to her, her company, and her choreography. She, Archie Savage, and Tally Beatty are the stars. Released in 1941, it includes Ciudad Maravillosa and early versions of Los Indios, Batucada, and Adios Terras. All are based on Brazilian themes. Catherine put her field studies to work. In the 1940s, she came to New York with her dance company. In a short time, the city was awash with stories of the innovative and highly dramatic dancer choreographer whose series of ballet recitals titled Tropics and La Jazz Hot introduced audiences to primitive rhythms, rumbas, both Cuban and Mexican, island songs, plantation and menstrual dances, including the ballet Bear Rabbit and La Jazz Hot with everything from boogie woogie and honky tonk numbers. Almost single-handedly, Catherine Dunham saw to it that black dance was taken seriously, critic John Martin wrote in the New York Times. With the arrival of Catherine Dunham on the scene, the prospects for the development of a substantial Negro art dance began to look decidedly bright. Her performance with her group may very well become a historic occasion, for certainly never before in all its efforts of recent years to establish the Negro dance as a serious medium has there been so convincing and an authoritative an approach. Miss Dunham has apparently based her theory on the obvious fact, so often overlooked, that if the Negro is to develop an art of his own, he can only begin with the seed of that art that lie within him. The seeds are abundant and unique. Indeed, it would be difficult to think of any people with a richer heritage of dance begging to be made use of. Yet in the past, there has been those who have started out by denying this heritage and smoothing it over with the gloss of another alien racial culture that deceives no one. The potential greatness of the Negro dance lies in its discovery of its own roots and the crucial nursing of them into growth and flower. It is because she has showed herself to have both the objective quality of the student and the natural instinct of the artist that she has done such a truly important job. In 1940, she appeared on Broadway in Cabin in the Sky, the all-black musical extravaganza starring Ethel Waters and Dooley Wilson, directed by George Balanchine. She also collaborated with Balanchine on the choreography. The show opened at the Martin Beck Theater in October of 1940 and ran until March of 1941, playing 156 performances. Following Cabin in the Sky, Dunham and her company were able to reach a far wider audience with Tropical Review, Carib Song, and Balneg. Yet the serious artist that Dunham was, audiences often seemed focused on her as the kind of sultry, sexy vixen she had played in Cabin in the Sky. American audiences of the period still were not ready to officially parade or accept a black woman as any kind of feminine ideal but there were always covert ways which such a woman was discovered nonetheless. So while audiences congratulated themselves on appreciating Dunham's skillful renderings of island ritual dances, what they actually responded to the most was the healthy sexual ambience Dunham and her troupe exuded. Excerpts from the reviews of the company's work simply spotlight the era's fascination with Dunham's sexuality. Of Tropical Review, the New York Mirror's critic wrote, a tropical review that is likely to send thermometers soaring to the bursting point, tempestuous and torrid, raffish and revealing. None of this sexuality business was lost on Hollywood, which, seldom known for spotlighting a serious dance company, soon imported Dunham's troupe West for appearances in Star Spangled Rhythm, Stormy Weather and Cashbox. Movie audiences from around the nation often viewed them as colorful, exotic, erotic black entertainers with plenty of rhythm and pizzazz. Interestingly, 
When MGM filmed Cabin in the Sky, it chose the mild-mannered, less exotically sexy Lena Horne to play Georgia. For a movie industry that both enjoyed and feared the idea of black sexuality, Katherine Dunham may have well been considered too brazen to be cast in a proper role in a film that cut her off from the cultural veneer that generally made her sex acceptable. In 1941, Dunham married Canadian John Pratt, an established white artist who joined her company as its set and costume designer. Henceforth, he would design sets and costumes for virtually every production of the Dunham Company and every costume Catherine would wear on stage and in films. During a 120-city tour of her Tropical Review in 1944, Dunham made newspaper headlines following an incident at a Cincinnati hotel. Arriving at the hotel with reservations made for her by her white secretary, only to be told by the management that there was no room and that she would have to leave, Dunham flatly refused to budge, informing the hotel, you'll have to carry me out. Later, she sued. Then in Louisville, Kentucky, when she discovered that except for six blacks on a lower floor, the rest of the black population at her performance in a municipal auditorium was to sit in a special section in a balcony. She interrupted the applause at the conclusion of her show to make an announcement to the audience. Friends, she was quoted saying, we are glad we have made you happy. We hope you have enjoyed us. This is the last time I shall play Louisville because the management refuses to let people like us sit by people like you. Maybe after the war, we shall have democracy and I can return. Until then, and at this point it is said in the newspapers that she shook her finger at the audience. God bless you for you'll need it. Needless to say, the white audience was in an uproar, both after what the management did announce that it would be no more segregated audiences for other Negro performers. Dunham had made her point. Later when she played the army camps, she again took a strong stand against the military segregated policies. No one can say for sure what effect Dunham's outspokenness had on her career, but it is now obvious that the 1940s were her peak years. She kept her company alive for three decades, although there were always financial difficulties. In 1945, the Dunham School in New York moved to 220 West 43rd Street, where it continued to operate until 1957. A year later, the Dunham School was renamed as the Catherine Dunham School of Arts and Research. Its components were the Dunham School of Dance and Theater, the Department of Cultural Studies, and the Institute for Caribbean Research. Teachers in the dance division included Todd Bolander Ballet, Marie Bryant Tap and Boogie, and Jose Limon Modern Dance. The Dunham Technique was taught by Tommy Gomez, Archie Savage, Lavinia Williams, and Sevilla Fort, who also taught ballet. Teachers in the drama division included Herbert Berghoff Acting, John Pratt Visual Design, and Carl Volimer History of Drama and Playwriting. Among the performers who studied at the school over the years were Arthur Mitchell, James Dean, Peter Gennaro, Marlon Brando, Cheetah Rivera, Eartha Kitt, and Jose Ferrer. In the 1950s, she was back in Hollywood for Mambo and segments of Green Mansions, which she choreographed. In 1962, she launched a spectacular production of Bamboche. For white America, she had at first been an agreeable social symbol, simply the Negro making progress in a free society. But once she took that symbol business seriously and spoke out, she was no longer needed. Then too, who was to say what effect her marriage to John Pratt had? Throughout the 1950s, Dunham and her company toured Mexico, South America, Europe, East Asia, Australia, New Zealand, and North Africa. Against advice, Catherine premiered her ballet Southland at the Tetro Municipal in Santiago, Chile. Its story centers on the lynching of a black man falsely accused of sexually assaulting a white girl in the American South. Dunham's dramatic treatment of it was shocking. Under pressure from the U.S. Embassy, which objected to the negative picture of American society it gave to foreign audiences, the ballet was removed from the program. In the 1950s, Catherine no doubt feeling the stings of bias against her company publicly asked why the State Department had not backed a group that had already performed in 38 countries. The familiar fighting spirit was still there. Catherine Dunham's career and her position in American popular culture was never a relaxed affair. 
Yet Dunham, like Lena Horne, introduced the idea that the black entertainer indeed did have a specific responsibility to his or her community. Signs of trouble for Catherine's company began when their third European tour ended in Vienna. Because of bad management by their impresario, the company was stranded without money. To raise funds, Dunham quickly negotiated contracts for television shows and a club date. The Dunham Company eventually disbanded. Dunham assembled pickup companies for later special events, but 1960 effectively marks the end of the continuous history of a company of dancers trained by her in a Dunham technique and coached by her to perform Dunham choreography. In 1962, Catherine Dunham, a few former Dunham dancers, and a royal troupe of Morocco appeared in a review, Bamboche, at the New York's 54th Street Theater. The title is a Haitian term for get together and have a good time. After eight performances, the show closed. It was Dunham's last appearance on Broadway. In 1963, Dunham was called upon to choreograph a production at the Metropolitan Opera, directing dances for Giuseppe Verdi's Aida. It was the first time in 30 years that a black American had been given the honor of choreographing at the famed New York Opera. In 1964, Dunham began a collaboration with Southern Illinois University choreographing Charles Gnoll's Faust. Dunham accepted a position at Southern Illinois University in East St. Louis in the 1960s. She founded the Performing Arts Training Center in East St. Louis, setting up a dance program for disadvantaged youth with the hopes that she could use art to keep youngsters from violence and gangs. According to the New York Times, Dunham said her goal was to make the individual aware of himself and his environment, to create a desire to be alive. She counseled youth as well, calming their angry spirits with her soft but firm voice and the power of her presence. Catherine wrote several books, many published under the pseudonym K. Dunn. Her books included 1946's Journey to Akinpong, 1959's A Touch of Innocence, Memoirs of Childhood, 1969's Island Possess, and 1984's Dances of Haiti. In 1977, the Catherine Dunham Museum External and Children's Workshop was opened in East St. Louis. The museum collection consisted of furniture, paintings, musical instruments, costumes, decorations, photographs, sketches, ethnic art objects, and a cross-section of personal belongings documenting Dunham's life. In 1982, she retired from Southern Illinois University. In December of 1983, Catherine Dunham was one of five recipients of the Kennedy Center Honors in Washington, D.C. At the evening performance, Agnes DeMille made the presentation to Dunham from the stage of the Opera House, giving a graceful, affectionate tribute to her friend and showing film clips of Dunham's signature works. Dunham and her fellow honorees, singer Frank Sinatra, actor James Stewart, stage and movie director Ilya Kazan, and composer and critic Virgil Thompson. Watching from the presidential box, they were seated with President Ronald Reagan and First Lady Nancy Reagan. Catherine had a deep connection to Haiti, starting with her time there as a young anthropology student. She felt a kinship with the Haitian people and took on their plight as her own. In 1961, she established a medical clinic there. In 1992, at the age of 82, Dunham went on a 47-day hunger strike to protest the treatment of Haitian boat refugees who were fleeing their country but were turned back. Later in life, the honors poured in. She was considered a living, breathing historical institution in and of herself. Throughout her distinguished career, Catherine Dunham earned numerous honorary doctorates, awards, and honors. Among the lists are the Presidential Medal of Arts, the Plaque d'Honneur, Haitian American Chamber of Commerce Award, French Legion of Honors, Southern Cross of Brazil, Grand Cross of Haiti, NAACP Lifetime Achievement Award, the Albert Schwitzer Music Award at Carnegie Hall, Lincoln Academy Laureate, and the Urban League's Lifetime Achievement Award. Ms. Dunham's recognition also includes a star on a St. Louis Walk of Fame, inclusion in the book I Have a Dream, and the Women's International Center's Living Legacy Award. In her final year, she received an honorary degree in fine arts from Harvard, and Jacob's Pillow gave a special tribute to Catherine Dunham for her 93rd birthday. In 2000, Catherine Dunham was named America's Irreplaceable Dance Treasure. 
By the late 1990s, she was widowed and living near the St. Louis area. Her friends moved her to New York to help provide care for her. By this time, Dunham was nearly bedridden with severe arthritis. She died on May 21, 2006 in an assisted living facility in New York City. She was 96. She is survived by her daughter. Her legacy continues through the efforts of her daughter, Marie Christine Dunham Pratt, with the Catherine Dunham Center of Arts and Humanities and an Institute for Dunham Technique Certification. The living Dunham tradition has persisted. Catherine Dunham was a woman far ahead of her time. Her technique was a way of life. Over her lifetime, Catherine Dunham accomplished many firsts as a dancer, choreographer, anthropologist, educator, author, and world humanitarian. As an artist, her striking dance innovations remain a source of inspiration for dancers and choreographers to follow. Catherine Dunham, Queen Mother of Black Dance and Onyx Queen. If you enjoyed this video, please share, like, and subscribe to this channel. Thank you for watching.